Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Um, so first, what I want to do is I um, want to go back to the last question. And uh, yeah, I think I, I said something uh, incorrect yesterday. So I want to justify that. So, uh, so there was the question of whether one could, in principle, in this parent class, also come up with results that have the L2 norm on the W. And uh, I thought first that, uh, I, I, that there should be some result, but that's different. So let me just clarify what the, the difference is. So yesterday we were talking about this result here, but the, under the assumption of the sigmoidal activation function, we get this thing, and that involves this constant CF, which I now call CF1 because I want to, to highlight here the, the index that will now be a bit different. So, um, and what has been done in the literature by Klosowski and, and Baron in these two papers here and here, they have extended this result to, to value activation function, right? The value activation function is set, so it's an activation function that looks like that. So it's not a sigmoidal activation function because it's unbounded, doesn't go to one. And then they show that uh, for value activation function, actually you can get a similar result but you need to replace the CF1 that you had for the sigmoidal activation function by the CF2. And so here you need the, the square then, yeah? So here in, in this exponent, you need the, the square. And um, that means it's even worse than in the sigmoidal case for the value activation function here, because if you have the square, then uh, in order that this integral is finite, you need, um, more condition, you need stronger tail control on the on the Fourier transform of f um, that has to decrease faster to zero than if you would just have the exponent one here. And they also extend that for the squared value, and then they show that you even need to do the CF three here. But it's all with the all with the L one or one more. Good. That's just a, a small update from. On the discussion from yesterday, if you have other questions, uh, feel free to to ask them in the chat, for instance. Now, today I want to go to uh, uh, the next topic, and that's about uh, uh, the, what are now uh, why uh, are additional hidden layers in the neural network uh, useful, and why are, are deep neural networks better than shallow neural networks? Okay, so no one says that cell on neural networks are great, right? So that's, um, but um, deep neural networks, they perform quite reasonably well. And if we want to understand somehow, there must be somewhere some sort of difference. And the question is, what is it? And here we look mainly in the beginning from a function space perspective, and then later we go more to the uh, statistical uh, uh, theory. Okay, so the first thing I, I want to talk about is, is, is localization. So um, if you have a, a function system that you use in order to fit uh, your regression curve, then typically you want to be able to have uh, the possibility to, to fit some uh, a local thing, yeah? So imagine you have an indicator function, that's the true function that you want to learn. And um, now you want to find a, a function in your functions class that somehow approximates this indicator function. And suppose you also wanted this approximation and the difference between the approximation and the original indicator function um, converges with respect to, to the LP norms or so, say P small infinity. Um, and if you, if you want to, to do that, then that, that is essentially the sort of localization property. Now, if you're in one dimensions, um, it's quite easy to show that the uh, cell on your networks, they can uh, localize, but it's um, believed and I've never seen any proof and also not able to prove it myself, but it's quite believable that in higher dimensions, that uh, cell on your networks, they are not able to, to localize in the sense that they can approximate an indicator function on a say, square or so uh, in, in the LP norm. And so why is that? Because you with the cell on your network, you, you essentially you introduce these hyperplanes and they're always global 
global objects. So if you want to do that somehow outside of the domain, you you, you typically tend to to infinity, and that uh, always kills these sort of LP approximation bounds. And that's something which is also in deep learning is well known also for deep neural networks, although they can localize what I want to convince you in a second. Um, that extrapolation being like outside of the, the data regime uh, is typically quite bad with, with neural networks and that is um, uh, and that is of course also a problem for, for, for in, in practice. Okay, but uh, theoretically you can with, uh, with a deep neural network you can localize with, with what you cannot do with a, with a shallow neural network. And so how does, what's the argument for that? Well, the argument is, okay, so suppose I want to um, uh, approximate the indicator function on the square minus one, one to the D. Yes, in D dimensions, that's uh, the, the hypercube. Now, uh, what you can do is if you take, for instance, here just the, the heavy side activation function, that's an activation function that's sum from zero to one, um, then you can even uh, write that down in this form explicitly. Okay, so um, why is that an identity? Because while well, we have this outer uh, indicator function, and here we subtract the minus d, and here we sum over d, so the outer activation function only becomes one in the case where all of them, all of these terms, they have to be one, and when are these individual terms one they are one exactly if this x i is in minus one one so it's uh and it means all of them are equal to one if all of them are between minus one one and that means essentially you are in this in this minus one one to the d hypercube okay so it's a, a simple identity and that is also a, a neural network with two hidden with two hidden layers yeah so that's the activation function the first hidden layer um so you need uh, 2d uh, units in the first hidden layer and then you have this as the uh, you have one unit in the second activation function and that's the in the second uh, hidden layer and that's the um and that creates this outer sigma zero yeah so you can write down this then exactly now the heavy side uh, activation function has uh, excellent um mathematical properties but of course you can't use it for gradient descent because it doesn't have the a derivative. So that's also the reason why people came up with the sigmoidal activation functions as a sort of smooth version of the heavy side activation function. And so, but the, the argument here is that essentially this sort of, that this identity uh, can be approximated with lots of uh, uh, activation functions. And then you can do that and then you can build a two hidden layer neural network that uh, approximates the identity and then you can also show that this approximation is lp um, um, just to to give you an idea so if you take a sigmoidal activation function right again that's something that looks like this then if you make if you write sigma alpha x and you make the alpha large what does that have for an effect it has essentially effect that this uh where it goes from zero to one, essentially that, that shrinks this, this interval, yeah? So, so the, the increase becomes sharper. So you essentially you approximate the, the heavy side function by making alpha large. So um, that means essentially you can take the identity from the previous um, from the previous slide and wherever you have the sigma zero, you put the sigma alpha sig uh, times the, the argument and then make alpha large and then you get the indicator function back. And for the value activation function, it's um, uh, right. The value activation function is this thing here. It's not a sigmoidal activation function, and um, in this case, you can subtract two two values, um, and you scale them by by alpha to make them also sharper. So uh, if you scale them by alpha, you make it like this, and then you subtract the second one, and then you also get essentially approximate the. The, the heavy side or the, the indicator function on the positive numbers with that by making alpha large. Okay, and so with this trick, you can then also show that you can in principle do a localization with, uh, with the value activation function. But of course, uh, so if you want to get good approximations, then you need to choose the alpha large. And that's exactly the same thing which we discussed yet, uh, yesterday also for the, in the proof of the universal approximation property. That's something that always comes back that we have to take the parameters 
to, to, to tend to infinity in order to prove something. And that is really annoying because that's something you, you cannot really learn if you have large, large parameters. Um, okay, and that is, um, yeah, just to give a bit more background here, um, that comes also back in a lot of um, papers on statistical theory, approximation theory for neural networks. And typically, if people talk about sigmoidal activation functions, then they often have conditions on how fast the sigma x and tends to zero as x goes to minus infinity, so in this direction, or how fast it tends to one if sigma x goes if x goes to plus infinity. And why do you need these sorts of um, uh, tail uh, control here? Why do we need this uh, tail control here? Because exactly you want to make this, uh, you, you want to form the limit to the to the heavy uh, to, to to converge to something which is close to the to the heavy side function, and um, that uh, if you have such a condition, then that allows you to give some uh, quantitative control on the on the convergence speed. Yeah. Um, now you can wonder: is that so, so? Localization is definitely a good thing if you think about approximation of of objects. But if you think about, um, then you might argue, okay, so why do we actually take neural networks, which are each like, uh, if you take values or so, then that they, they are global functions, okay? So these these individual units, they are global functions. So so why is that uh, useful? And I think it's useful mainly for the for the training, okay? So what you want is that. Um, if you do gradient descent methods, then you want essentially that all the data points somehow affect all the all the functions, because if you have that somehow you that then the gradient can you you can you can estimate the gradient, and also the gradient does not become zero. Suppose, for instance, you in the initialization you you initialize a localized function, but in this localization domain there's no data point. Then your gradient will always be zero in in, all, in this gradient descent thing, and then then somehow you will never update this this part, um, and that's not very good. So you need somehow that uh, the functions that you generate that de essentially they should depend on all the all the data that you have, and that really for the gradient descent uh, gives some advantages, um, and therefore I think that's um, there's a trade-off between what we want in localization and for, for mathematics or approximation. And then the global functions for the for the gradient descent. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, another thing I, here is um, that certain functions you can uh, better uh, represent with deep neural networks than that with shallow neural networks. And uh, since we have been discussing uh, yesterday in the proof for the universal approximation property, um, these polynomials. Let me also do that. Uh, show you an example with uh, polynomials. So suppose we want to uh, uh, build a network that approximates the uh, uh, x to the power two to the power k. Yeah, and two to the power k is just because then everything becomes a bit easier now. Um, but you could do that for all for all other powers more or less in the same in the same way. Um, okay, so what we did yesterday is we took these uh, um, kth order differences and from the k, uh, okay, so now I shouldn't call it k, so elf order difference in order to approximate uh, the function x to the l. Yeah, so that's uh, elf order difference. And then you get something like if you rescate everything in the right way, then you you get a neural network, a shallow neural network that approximates the the function x to the l in one dimension. Everything is now in one dimension. Um, so that means that if we want to to approximate the function x to the two to the k, then we need to take the two to the k order difference. And from yesterday's talk, we know that this requires a neural network, a shallow neural network that has uh, L plus one, in this case, two to, two to the K plus one, a main, many um, units in the hidden layer. Okay, so that's quite a, a big number of units and the number of units scales with the degree of the, of the polynomial that we want to approximate. 
And so now what I want to show you is that if you take a deep neural network, you can do that with many much less um, units, okay? So that you need essentially just of the order of K uh, units and to, to do this the, the, the same thing. Okay, so what, what do we do is essentially we, um, we build, we look at the, the X square thing. Yeah, so that's something that you can write down with, with the second order difference, and then you had to divide by the second derivative at the point T, where the because uh, so it's not a polynomial, then the, there is a point where the second derivative does not vanish, and then you did the h squared, and then you have to let h tend to zero, and then you essentially can approximate um, uh, the function x squared, and that. Uh, is essentially the same thing as above, but now just for for the, the, the second uh, for for the square function. And what we do now is essentially we build a network, right? For this, we need a, a shallow neural network with three units in the hidden layer, so two plus one, and then we stack them on top of each other, and we do that k times. And I have showed you this on the next slide. Um, so here, that's not that's the deep construction. Okay, so here's deep. Uh, a neural network. So essentially, we built uh, this part. Uh, that is what I showed you on the previous slide. It's a, a network that uh, approximates the function x squared. We have these uh, three uh, parts that we need for the second order difference, right? This, this one, this one, and this one that we stick in the hidden layer. And then we get x squared out. And then we use the x squared as the input for the next a neural network that has exactly the same the same uh, network parameters, but it has now the input x squared, and so it computes x squared squared, so it computes x to the power of four. Okay, and so we do that uh, k times, and then we get uh, uh, x to the power two to the k here out of that. Yeah. Um, and um, now the thing is that in this um, in this hidden layer, and then in all these hidden layers, we don't need to apply the, the activation function. Okay, so we can take the activation function to be the identity. And if that is the case, then we can merge, we can merge these uh, hidden layers into one hidden layer. Okay, so it's just a, a matrix matrix multiplication that gives again a matrix. If you think back about the mathematical formulation of a neural network, so that means here in this case we can condense it even more. And we can write the same thing in, in this form here, where we just essentially we, we merge the, this layer and uh, this layer because there's no activation function in between into one into one layer, and then we get this formulation, and that essentially is a is a neural network that approximately computes this function x to the power uh, two to the k. Um, and so now let's look at how many. How many uh, units and how many layers do we need now? We need uh, in every of these uh, layers. So, so the width of the net network is always uh, three in all the hidden layers. And how many layers do we need? I think we need uh, k layers. Yeah. So we need, uh, three uh, k three times k Johannes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There is a question by an online participant. Uh, the question is the following. Could we use a product activation function in a sparse neural network in order to be able to get the basis for polynomial of a given degree and then just sum before the output? And would it perfectly model the polynomials of a given degree or not? Uh -huh. uh, okay. okay. So, so you can see the question on the chat. If uh, I was yeah, not clear yeah. in rephrasing the question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I. I can. I can read it. Yeah. Thanks for reading it out. Um, and. Uh, for, uh, yeah. Um. So, what in principle you can do here is you could take the, um, the activation function sigma x equals um, x squared. Um. And uh, yesterday in this universal approximation property, we have seen that this does not give you the universal approximation because it's just uh, in a shallow neural network, it just uh, creates the square functions. But if you allow for deep neural networks and you make the depth also tend to infinity, then of course, with this activation function, you can create the, all the, the, the whole space of, 
uh, multivariate uh, polynomials, and that is good enough um, to to get to give good rates. Also, um, it's not, yeah, yeah. I, uh, so, so all the rates we have seen yesterday sent to you, I guess maybe I'm not sure about Baron's class, but for the for the general like beta smooth functions and so yeah, that that would work. But um, in practice, it's known that this uh, square activation function is not uh, working uh, very well. And um, also for the square activation function, what I discussed in the previous slide, I don't think that you get, for instance, localization with, with, with that. Yeah. So, but for this specific problem that we are looking here at, uh, namely, we want to build this x to the two to the k function, for that it would be a, a very, very good activation function indeed. Um, okay. Um, and then finally, um, let me talk about the so called uh, Kolmogorov or not approximation theorem. And that's something uh, super weird, super, um, for, for me, it was uh, extremely non intuitive for, for a long while. Um, so, what it shows is that um, every continuous function can be, can be written perfectly. By a sort of a two hidden layer neural network. Okay, so and here you really need, need the, 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 also the second hidden hidden layer. Um, and um, we know that with a one hidden layer neural network, you cannot get a perfect, uh, like an identity. And it's really the, the additional hidden second layer that allows you to. To get a perfect identity, so here's really something happening if you go from one hidden layer to to two hidden layers. Um, and I think that that also is a good indication that there's something happening to go to to, to deeper layer, layers. And let me explain you this, um, you know, walk a bit through this in in, uh, in more detail. So the most, I mean, the the Kolmogorov analog representation that goes back to the 50s and back then on was the first proof, and so it was non-constructive, um, though very short, but uh, almost un non-understandable. And I think by now we have much more modern forms of the KA representation here. And one of them is this uh, from the PG thesis by Brown. And uh, so what it says essentially that if you, if for any continuous function and in D variables, uh, you can find uh, a monotone function Psi so that comes back here. That's a real valued function. And also you can find a function G that yields also a real valued function such that the multivariate function can be essentially written as, as a composition of, of univariate functions. And then you, of course you have to, to have these sums here. Okay, so on these univariate functions are also, are also continuous. Um, and uh, what, what is, yeah, very good question now. Uh, does the psi, psi and G depend on F in this theorem? Of course, there should be some sort of dependence on F because the, the left hand side depends on the F. So something on, on the right hand side has to depend on F. And so from the uh, formulation, you see that the A, D, P, and C, Q, they don't depend on F. And also the Psi does not depend on F because. Um, uh, so and the only thing that really depends on f in this formulation is this function g. Yeah, so there's a, a that's a g which is also somehow a g of f. Yeah, but you have a multivariate function, and that uh, uh, decodes uh, somehow a, a univariate function somehow that that influences what the, that univariate function uh, g is. And so that means if we now think about this as um, as, as a neural network, then um, we can view this also as a two hidden layer neural network where this is the activation function and the hidden in the first hidden layer the psi and the activation function in the second hidden layer is the, the g and then we have uh, we have um, uh, the architecture here for this neural network would be so we have input uh, dimension d then we have in the first hidden layer we have uh, also d in the second layer we have 2d plus 1, so that's the sum here. And then we have uh, uh, the output layer is 1. Yeah, so that's a uh, two hidden layer neural network, which has 
the, the width of the, the network is essentially of the order of t, but it's not very wide or so. And uh, the, the interesting bit is really that you get here not an approximation, but really an exact identity. Um, okay, so that's a, a strange thing. And of course, also what uh, Fabi was asking is, uh, so there's this F dependence in the G, and that means that you cannot pick G as an activation function, right? So because uh, activation function has to be chosen beforehand, and if the activation depend function depends on the function that you want to learn, then that, that can cannot be that cannot be done. Still, people have argued essentially that this is a um, that has really much the flavor and that, that should tell us something about uh, neural networks. Um, so here's just a summary, essentially also based on the on the question. Um, so let me go on. <coughs> so, um, yeah, uh, what is also interesting if, is if we relate it to what is observed in practice. Yeah, so people have observed in practice that what you learn in the in the first hidden layers in the neural network is a bit uh, a generic thing that does not necessarily depends so much on the function that you want to learn and all what you want essentially the, the information about the f is really something that happens basically in the in the last hidden layer yeah and that's just something where uh yeah based on on the sort of observation people have proposed uh, the pre-training and what does pre-training mean is essentially suppose you have a small data set and if you have a small data set then deep learning from scratch is not uh, working well well right you know we, we all know you need uh, lots of lots of data so what in pre-training the, the the idea is that you then take a trained network from a different but related task yeah suppose you want to classify tumors or so then you take some uh, a trained network from some image classification problem maybe the image net network or so then uh, you chop off the last layer, the output layer, the weight in the last layer, and keep everything uh, essentially on uh, the same as before. And then you, because what happens in the first hidden layers is somehow independent of, of, of the, 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 the function that you want to learn. So therefore, you can essentially keep everything up to the last hidden layer. And with this new data set, essentially, you just train the, the network parameters in the, in the last hidden layer. Um, and um yes in 2017 or so um now pre-training is not so it's a bit outdated uh, and people have found better ways where you then you essentially just take a, still take a, a, a trained network but now you train all the all the parameters that uh, essentially uh, works even a bit better but uh, i think that is also something really people have observed and that comes back in this KI representation that's in the first hidden layer that something more generic going on and the, the dependence on the F is really in the in the last hidden layer. Um, okay, so another good question is an intuitive argument or a simple example to see why this result holds. Yeah, I've been actually uh, also thinking about this for, for a long uh, time and uh, so I understand it now better. So suppose you you have a function f okay and the f is a function on on rd uh, i'd say on on so it's a function on zero oops something different but nice okay uh, so that's a function on on zero one to to the d so what you can do is you can you have maybe have ever heard about a, a space filling curve yeah, so that is something that maps your zero one to the D, it maps that uh, to uh, zero one. Yeah, so that's a, a space spinning curve. So for every point, you get somehow a point on, on zero one. And what you can do is essentially you can write this as the uh, F uh, composed with gamma minus one, uh, composed with gamma, okay? So that means you map your zero one to the D to zero one, and then you invert that. And this is what you call G. So you get a G composed with gamma. So my handwriting is terrible with this, with this pen here, but so, so it's a G composed with gamma. 
and the G is F composed with gamma to the minus one. So, and that the, now is that the G is of course now a function from zero one to the D to, to uh, so from zero one to, to, to R, right? So, and so that's a univariate function. And that has a bit uh, the structure of the, the KA representation, but the KA representation is much more clever than, than that. There's a problem here because it's known as Nettles uh, theorem that uh, you cannot really invert the gamma to the minus one for space filling curve. So that's not, um, uh, does not exist. Um, and so you have that, that therefore all these sums uh, occur here. So um, that is really a non-trivial part. The second thing is that uh, you want the, the gamma function here, the space filling curve, you want to have, this is now a function from zero one to the D to zero one. And you want that the space, uh, this, this uh, gamma, that this is um, uh, that this is an additive function. Okay, so that's where the structure of the interior part. So if we go back, yeah, so here this this thing is essentially then the gamma, and that is the okay. Forget about the sum because the, the sum comes of, of all these issues with the space spinning curve. So the G is F composed gamma to the minus one. So the gamma here has to be an additive function, and that is another constraint that you put on the space filling curve. I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm never sure what is the space filling curve and what is the inverse of the space filling curve. So now I call gamma the space filling curve, but I think it's the inverse of the space filling curve. Anyway, so it's, uh, and, and um, so that constrains the choice of the space filling curve quite a bit. Um, and um, so the problem with this approach is, and, and previous approaches is that if you define it in this way, uh, you can get very, very rough functions G. For, for to represent f and they are unreasonable rough in a way and so what i have been working on is uh, to find uh, ka type representations such that you can uh, get uh, the g's that have the right the right smoothness such that you can essentially put pull everything which you like approximation in theory in r to the d that you can somehow reduce it to a univariate approximation theory and that is that is possible but this is also related to these issues with the uh, with the space filling curves and the inverses of, of them and therefore you have to somehow you are not mapping and in, in my approach you don't map to zero one but you you map actually to the to the contour set and um, based on that you can then really come up later also with new new network architectures to to approximate functions so if you're more interested in these data you can maybe look up the, the article Okay, um, so that's about uh, the KA representation. If there are no more questions, then let me now talk about uh, deep value networks. Yeah, so now we look specifically at this uh, value activation function, which is the maximum of X and, and zero. And that is something which would have been probably not been allowed to publish in the 90s. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit. Because in the 90s, it was really much <clears throat> that if you build theory, it should be for large classes of activation functions and that you pick one activation function and then study that and properties of that, that would have been somehow prohibitive. And nowadays, um, because we know that there are uh, activation functions that are performed particularly well in the deep learning, we are somehow allowed to do that. And we can study, for instance, yeah, so what happens for um, this um, uh, one specific activation function the value, what type of, of properties does it have? And here I want to show you three properties uh, which we link um, value networks and, and depth. And first of all, you, yeah, it's about identity, then how many, uh, it's a piecewise linear function always, and then the, the, the final thing um, that you can overcome this, this issue that you always have to take the parameters uh, to be very large. I think those are the three main advantages that I'm aware of why deep value networks are have, have good properties. Okay, so let let me first come to the um, to the to the um, identity. So, if you have a, a deep neural network, I think the the most important uh, operation that you want to be able to perform in the deep neural network is that you can pass forward uh, the identity operator. 
uh, some or you you want you, you don't want to change the signal at all. Suppose uh, you can learn something in three layers, but you have somehow specified five layers in your neural network. Then somehow the in your network should be able to pass the the thing that you have learned after three hidden neural networks uh, hidden layers you, to to pass it uh, to the output without changing it, and also without consuming too many too many parameters. And that is exactly what you can do with uh, uh, with um, with the deep uh, value network. So you can, um, if you have an output of a of a hidden layer, then um, that is always a, a non-negative uh, number, right? Um, and uh, now because this uh, value function has a projection property, it's a projection on the on the non-negative numbers. So if you pass it then through the next layer and you don't change anything. Then you will still have exactly the same, the, the, the same signal. Okay, so the signal won't, won't change, and you just need essentially one parameter in your neural network to send, to, to send it to the next hidden layer, and then you can you get the same output there. Um, and that is something I think that is really crucial for 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 value networks. Um, so also that helps us a lot in the theory later for deep value networks because you often have to sort of you build a um, you build a function approximation by looking at smaller, you, you, you build it from smaller modules, which do parts of like partition of unity and uh, localized Taylor approximation, and then you want to put it together and so But for some of these things, you need more hidden layers to approximate it well. For some of them, you need less hidden layers. And at the end, you have to put everything together. So, so what you want is for the ones that need less hidden layers, somehow you want to, to add lots of these identity things in, in between and approximation theory, just to bring it to the to the same hidden layer, and then you can you can combine it. It's also a very good um, uh, tool um, for, for for theory that you have this this simple identity representation. Another thing that is um, uh, quite important now is the, the so-called uh, residual nets or uh, rest nets. I showed you yesterday a plot and increase of number of hidden layers. And the last one was uh, 152 layers, and that was for rest net architecture. The rest net architectures essentially where, where you um, initialize uh, at around the identity um, metrics. The, 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 so each of the weight matrices should be something like uh, close to the identity matrix. And for this, it's, um, uh, and it also has the sort of skip connection that it sends um, uh, the, the output from one hidden layer without changing and sending it to, to, the, to the later hidden layers. And sometimes also people build in um, artificially uh, skip connections. That means somehow uh, units without an activation function because they, they want to preserve the identity uh, also, you might have seen uh, units or so they send, they have also lots of these skip connections and so on. And so skip connections really sending like the identity to, to deeper networks without passing through the intermediate hidden layers. And so um, that is also really crucial for, for, for many network architectures. And that is something that can easy be, easily be learned with the, with the value if you haven't specified it before because it's, it has such a simple simple representation. And also for other uh, activation functions, it's, it's very hard um, to approximate the identity operator with them. Yeah, so if you have a value activation, uh, sorry, a sigmoidal activation function, it looks like this. So that means essentially if you have your, your, your input X gets sent to something which is in, in zero one. Yeah, so it's a, a function that is bounded from below by zero and from above by one. But how do you get, but now you want to get X back so if your x was five or so, and now you send it to zero one, and that is very hard to recover the x. So, so um, the identity is um, a big issue with uh, other activation functions, and that is something that really helps you once you go to to deep networks. So if you're in a shallow network, uh, the identity is not not an issue. Um, okay, so that's uh, the first thing. The, the second thing is that uh, what you can do with the deep value network. Um, is uh, you can generate quite, quite complex functions with few parameters. Okay, so maybe let me come back to, to this representation that we had yesterday of uh, what a neural network is. So we had uh, um, uh, so it was look, looking like this: the sigma v one w zero 
times x. Yeah, so that was that's a, a network function. Now, if if you have the value activation function, then you can convince yourself that this f of x is always a piecewise linear function in in x. Yeah, so um, each each unit is uh, is a hyperplane. Um, uh, and then truncated uh, to be on the positive, uh, only to to return the the, the, the non-negative uh, values, and so that that creates uh, uh, at one at most one one extra um, um, linear piece, um, and so the number of linear pieces and the number of units that's essentially the same in a in a shallow neural network. But if you add hidden layers, you can increase the number of uh, linear pieces, uh, and that can increase much faster than the number of, of parameters. So that that is exactly the trick to to generate um, uh, highly oscillating functions with a few parameters with a deep value network. And so why is that? Uh, why does that is is the, an advantage? Um, because we will also see later that certain smooth functions you can approximate very very well. Uh, with uh, with uh, deep value networks because of this uh, sort of doubling property that in every hidden layer you essentially double the number of linear pieces. So let me show you how like the, the, the main idea. So suppose we are in one dimension. So we take a so we have a one dimensional input and in the first hidden layer we generate this network and that maybe looks like okay so here's our that's the network that we generate. Okay. So, and now in the second hidden layer, we just have one, uh, one unit without a bias. And so it uh, takes the positive part of that, so the non negative part. So, what is the, what is the um, uh, value network that we get out after we have done that? So, we get uh, this thing, yeah? That's the, that's the function that we generate with the, after we have passed it through the second, to the second value, and the that's the the unit in the second hidden layer, this one here. Um, so now you can see what is what what was the number of linear pieces in the in the original uh, one. So that was uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So that was for the green function. We had eight linear pieces, and now for the uh, by adding one. Uh, Unit in the second layer, we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I, I think we, yeah. So, so it's, and you, you get uh, three or four more here, and that is just by, by by one unit. And in principle, by adding more units, you can you can get more and more, uh, yeah, a quickly increasing number of of linear pieces. So, um, and that is really by by stacking these these, these uh, units on top of each other than just uh, putting them next to each other. And that is um, an interesting thing. And there is a lot of work, for instance, where people uh, try to estimate bounds for the number of linear pieces that you can generate with a certain uh, architecture. Okay, so suppose you have an architecture, you have one input and one output, and then the width is uh, P1 to PL and the different uh, L hidden layers. So then, for instance, here's a bound that says like uh, how many how many linear pieces can you generate? And so here you see that this is really a product of these PJs. And here also you have a bound uh, that is, is a power in, in, of of L, the number of hidden layers. So you really see the sort of exponential growth that is possible with the number of uh, linear pieces. Whereas the number of parameters, right? The number of parameters, something like PJ. Uh, Pj minus one you know, over j. So the right the, the matrices they have dimension Pj times Pj minus one. So that's uh, this gives you one of these terms, and uh, then you have to sum over the j's to 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 sum over the different uh, weight matrices. So you see that the number of parameters and the number of linear pieces that you that you can generate that is uh, uh, that's not on the same level anymore. So the, the number of linear pieces can grow much much faster. Um, Okay, so that's uh, another another interesting feature here. Okay, there's a, a question. It is, is it usual to force some symmetry via uh, having negative weights in order to model the the, the negative values? Um, 
Okay. Um, no, no, no. So I, I, I see what I, I think I get what you mean. So if we um, suppose we want to, to to learn a function that has somehow a negative a negative output. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, the function is. Um, let me go to the previous slide. My, say we want to learn the function f of x equal to minus uh, three plus uh, cosine of x. Or so yeah, that's a function that is uh, entirely negative. So then it might make sense to to say okay, so we we change somehow that uh, the output of the value network or so is not um, a negative anymore, but we now look at projection functions on the negative numbers and not on the positive numbers anymore. Um, but um, here that doesn't matter really because essentially you can you can always multiply these entries in the in the output layer by minus one and then you get exactly the same thing. So that's uh, yeah, there, there's no need to do that. So the, the so 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 the the sign of what the thing is, is essentially happens in the in the output layer. Um, okay. Um, uh, oh. Johannes, the result of Fabio who asked you whether this is a one-d result or holds in any dimension. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think there are sure results in, in multiple dimensions, but um, I must say, um, yeah, I, uh, there's also so, so many papers, and um, I, I could look it up. Um, so, uh, but. Uh, uh, yeah, so how does the, the, so we would be interested in how the dimension uh, changes, how does, uh, I think the, the main interest is always in, in understanding the, the effect on the depth, on the, on the L, and that is somehow exponential here. Um, and the dimension, I believe, in, it's not so relevant in this in these formulas. Yeah, I, I cannot imagine or uh, hardly imagine somehow that there's some some interesting dimension effect here and and what what can be done. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely one could uh, probably if, or if it does not exist, one it might be interesting to extend it to to several dimensions. Um, also, I want to say that the fact that you can generate our uh, uh, functions with a lot of linear pieces does not imply that every function with a lot of linear pieces can be generated by somehow a few um, parameters on the, on the deep value network. Um, it is just very specific functions and here you see that essentially, right, that uh, you have lots of these uh, pieces are somehow in common uh, because of the, 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 the second uh, activation, the, the activation function in the second hidden layer. Um, and so that is that constraints, of course, the space uh, a lot. And so the question is: Are there interesting objects in, in all the like uh, highly oscillating functions that you can generate with a few network parameters? And I, and, and indeed that is the case. And I come to that. And uh, so here's another example. It's also in the in the one-dimensional case, but that is simply enough. So what what can we do? Is we can build a a value network. It's a shallow value network that uh, uh, does, uh, creates this function here. Okay, so here we have uh, it's a function from say zero one to okay that should be oops. Okay, so right, um, that should be a zero one. Um, and uh, so it's. Uh, it consists of two units in the in the hidden layer. Yeah, so it's a value network with two hidden units in the in the hidden layer, and that's the function. Okay, so it doesn't uh, seem very uh, exciting, but now what you can do is you can compose it uh, k times. Okay, so you just compose t with t with t with t. So let's do it uh, one time. So if you compose it one time, you get this function. Okay, so it has two uh, of these uh, sawtooth uh, things, and if you if you do it k times, you get uh, something where you have uh, two to the k many of these things. Okay, so you see that the number of linear pieces also goes with two to the k in this case, and you get uh, although you just compose k uh, 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 networks with each other, so that's a uh, you can realize that with a neural network of, of depth uh, k. 
Um, and so here's the here's the thing. And um, so that's something I, I was mistakenly written here. So that's uh, what we do. So, okay, so that's a neural network that uh, builds the function t. And that's the same neural network that builds the function t. And then by uh, putting them together, we compose t. Uh, we, 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 we build a network that uh, uh, constructs the function t composed with t and so on. And then here we get another t. So that is the network configuration that uh, is uh, this uh, k times composition of, of the of the function t. And of course, again, we have to think that here and here and here, we don't put an activation function. And so then we merge these two layers into one layer and then we get to, to this uh, as, the, as the neural network that computes t to the k and t to the k is, okay, so that is also here, uh, t to the k. Okay, so you can get uh, like these sort of fractal shapes and so by, by composing functions. Of, of course, uh, uh, Fractals are often defined via uh, also iterative procedures and compositions and so on. And so that's uh, very natural. Okay, so you get this, this sort of functions. Now you, you, you can say, okay, that's um, still not an interesting uh, object because it, it's very highly oscillating. It uses very few parameters, right? If you look here, we have K layers and we have in each layer, we have uh, two hidden units. So that's uh, essentially like of the order of K parameters, network parameters that we have to learn in order to get something with two to the K many, many uh, linear pieces. But so why, why, why should we care? So why is that now so interesting? Well, um, and that uh, these functions that we have just seen, it helps us a lot to approximate actually the, the multiplication operator. And that is something that we discussed also yesterday, the multiplication is something which is in a way quite orthogonal to what neural networks do and how they are uh, built, but still we want somehow the, that they can do multiplications. Um, and this sort of trick that exactly the, the, the T functions, that is uh, how, how we can efficiently implement the, the multiplication or approximately to multiplication with a deep uh, value network. Okay, let me, let me tell you this in a bit more detail. First of all, if we do want to do multiplication, essentially we can do a reduction step where we just have to show that we can find a, a neural network that can approximate uh, the X square function in a, in a reasonable way. Okay, so why, why is that enough? Because if we can do the X square function, then essentially we can, we can build this, yeah, in a, by adding a hidden layer. In the first hidden layer, we compute this interior thing and then we use the neural network that computes the square function. And then we can also use an, a, another line in our neural network. If we, if we extend it, we compute this in the first activation, after the first activation function should be done. And then we do the, the, the square network afterwards, okay? And then uh, we use this uh, polarization identity that tells us that this together is uh, the, the multiplication of X times Y. Okay, so now here you see this sort of modular structures that we use in order to, for, for network constructions. We, we look at simpler things, for instance, here just networks that can do squaring, and then we combine it with other layers to do other stuff in, in order to, to come to more complex things, in, in this case, uh, to, to approximate a multiplication operator. Okay, so I hope uh, or maybe I can also draw it for you. I'm not sure whether I have written it here on the slide. Hey, no. Uh, so, so we have our x and y as input. So, okay, before it was called x one and x y. So we compute x plus y of two, and um, here in the and here we compute x minus y over two, and now we compose it with this uh, x squared uh, z to z squared network. So it might take several layers, and then we get after. Okay, so that's that, this might be several hidden layers in our network, then we get, uh, then we have to combine that in order to get X times Y. Okay, so that's essentially the, the, the idea how to do that. Um, okay, so all what we need is uh, essentially to understand how we can do squaring and the squaring is essentially the thing we, we always uh, have do at some point. We, we need uh, to, yeah, the, the, to 
uh, there's only only person in one dimension, you could do it with the second order term. Um, as I explained before, and the main issue here is that if you do that, um, you have to use the, the large parameters. You have to let h tend to zero and that blows up the, the parameters. For instance, right there in the second hidden layer, there are parameters that are a, one over h squared sigma prime uh, prime of uh, t. And if you make h small, that uh, makes these parameters very, very large. And with the deep value network, we um, can overcome this uh, large parameter uh, thing, and we can come with a construction that uh, uses uh, small parameters. And let me now show you how to do that and how to combine that with these T functions as that, that we have seen before. Okay, so here I have to see one my slide. Yeah, now I see my slide. Um, Okay, now we introduced functions t k. They're exactly the same as the functions t before, um, but they rescale. So instead, uh, so this t k, they are essentially the same what the t's have been doing before. But they send, uh, um, okay, they they do this and they send the signal not to one but to two to the minus k, and that's for convenience. Uh, later. And then what we do is we compose. Uh, these TK functions, and that defines our RK. Our, uh, the mathematical uh, result is that um, this function over here, so it's X squared, that can be populated uh, with the sum of these RK functions, going from 1 to M, up to an approximation error that is of order 2 to the minus Okay, and this is something to the right hand side. This is something that can be implemented by a, a deep uh, uh, value network. And we just have to see how many how many um, layers do we need, and how how wide should the layers be? Well, how many layers do we need? Since we have seen for R K, we need uh, eight layers. So, and then. Um, we, we pass forward uh, the identity with uh, for, for R1, we need one hidden layer, and then we can just send it to the output and with, using the skip connection that we have discussed before. And the most difficult one is to to build the RM function, and that needs M hidden layers. So, so in total, that's a deep value network with M hidden layers. And now we have to build all these functions RK and parallel, okay? So that makes the network wider. Excuse me, you honest. Excuse me, you yeah. I'm interrupting you because we've got some lagging, uh, perhaps because of uh, because the internet connection is not very good. Could you switch off your camera just to the, because sometimes there are blanks and we don't hear exactly everything you say. So, just oh, for okay. the, so so sorry for this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 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 It's I better hope, now. Uh, Thank you. It's better, yeah. Okay, good. Um, that's uh, I'm very un that's very unfortunate. Yeah. Okay, so we have discussed M hidden layers, and now the question is: Okay, so we want to build this right hand side by the, uh, implemented by a deep learning network. How many? Uh, like, what is the width? How many hidden units do we need in each of these uh, hidden layers? And well, for each of these R case, we we said essentially you need two hidden units, but you have built M to build M of them, so you get essentially something like M uh, two M. Uh, that's the width of the deep neural network that you have to do in order to build the right hand side. Um, okay, so that means essentially with something of depth m and number of uh, uh, units in each hidden layer 2m, so you still have a number of like a quadratic number of of parameters, but you get an approximation error that is 2 to the minus m. Yeah, so that means somehow you the approximation error is very, very quick compared to the number of parameters that you need in order to approximate this, uh, this function. And that is, of course, something which helps you. And the, the function x squared is a very smooth function. And typically, if you have something, if you know a bit about approximation theory, if you take piecewise linear splines and you want to uh, approximate a x square function and get with, with k parameters to get a rate one over k square, I think. And here this is much, much faster because you're stuck 
these these uh, functions on top of each other and that helps a lot yeah and that's very important for that also if you look into this construction you can see that all the okay that's a bit difficult here but like all the network parameters that we have right this this you, you implemented my new network they are all bounded by one okay so and that's really an interesting thing about these deep value networks that you can really with constrain yourself that all the network parameters to approximate a good function that they're really bounded. And that's, I think, a, a crucial thing and, and, and make that really something practical because you want that uh, a learning method can find that. And it, as I discussed yesterday, if the true parameters are a million or two million and you initialize it, it uh, gradient descent has to, to run for a long time to find it and it becomes very unstable as well to, to the training if you have to to, to cross uh, 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 you know, different scales of, of order of ma magnitudes in order to find the right parameters. So it shows that somehow for small parameters, there's a already good solution that can approximate the, the function x square and then also approximate the, the, the multiplication operator as I discussed before. Um, what I can do is now it's 11.04, so I'm talking a bit more than an hour now. Maybe I can uh, even make a five minutes break and then I, uh, we resume at uh, 11, uh, 9 or 11, uh, 10 past uh, 11. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, let's do it then this way. And then we see us in, in five minutes. Okay, maybe we can try to, to continue now. Are there... Are there questions at this moment? Uh, seems not to be the, the case. Um, what I can do is maybe I can try to just to do the the camera as well. And if again, if there's some problem with the with the audio or so, then just let me know again, and I I will. I will shut it down. Sometimes maybe it works better now. Um, and of course, I understand that all this is a bit uh, technical and so I go quite fast over that, but I, I think maybe it gives you some sort of impression on, on, on what type of things can be done, although maybe not all the details are entirely clear. So let me just summarize what we have uh, done here. Um, I'm waiting for the, for the slide. That is also a bit slow. Okay. I have just a small problem with the slide. I can't see the slides anymore. That's a bit bad. Can, can you see slide 19? Ah, okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, you can see it. I can't see it. Uh, I can't also write anything, but it's, uh, it's okay. Um, I have a uh, device here. So just to summarize uh, slide 19 is, um, yeah, so what I just said before, you need M hidden layers of the order of M network parameters to get an approximation of R2 to the minus N. And if we would have taken a shallow value network, we would have used this, essentially would have been required uh, two to the uh, M over two parameters to get an approximation R2 to the minus N. Yeah, so you see a, a sharp decrease of the number of parameters that we need in order to get the same approximation rate. And as I've told you before, that is somehow the, the Okay, now I have really problems. Um, you honest? Yes, could you repeat that, please? Uh, A1 cannot, uh, cannot hear neither. Um, Uh, Johannes, 
Could you? Could you try to to reconnect, maybe? Okay, I'm I'm back. Um, sorry for this. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, nothing happened. Um, so let's keep the uh, keep it without the the video. Um, okay. So I hope you you just understood that uh, this is a sharp. Uh, yeah, in, uh, decrease in the number of parameters that we need in order to get the same approximation error and the number of parameters is of course somehow the statistical complexity of the of the network so that's uh, good that uh, um, if that can when this be learned by by deep learning such a structure now let me come to uh, the next slide slide uh, 20 and that's just a summary of what we have done before as i mentioned that if you can do x square then you can do a uh, uh, multiplication and uh, so here's the result essentially that uh, um, by putting these additional hidden layers in there so now we need m plus four hidden layers uh, you can approximate the multiplication operator up to this error two to the minus m that comes from the from the approximation of the x square function um, and maybe no, not more has to be said about that so that's a good thing and here's just a, a, to, to represent like how the proof works it's very constructive in the sense that one can build these these networks, uh, and that is essentially the thing what also appeared in the proof. This is this, uh, some of these archa RK functions that we want to that we want to construct. Um, okay, so that's an um, interesting uh, feature of these deep value networks. And um, now let's come to slide uh, twenty two. Um, I hope that you can see slide uh, 22. Yeah, now I can also see it. Um, what else do we need in order to do function approximation? I mean, squaring is or, or multiplication is, is, is a nice thing, but uh, something else that we uh, want to do is somehow we want to build um, a local function approximation. And for localization, we need, to, for instance, a partition of unity. And then on each of these local bits, we can um use a local uh, Taylor expansion and uh, that together if we put all this together that gives us then a, a value network that uh, approximates a given function so that's the the idea that we take essentially these these localized functions those are products of and that's something you can build by a by a value network so these interior functions they can be easily built by a value network with uh, two hidden uh, uh, two active uh, two two units on the hidden layer, and then the multiplication we discussed before, and so these functions you can build and they form a partition of unity. That is essentially what this equation tells us. Okay, so on each of these localized functions, we want to build uh, um, a Taylor uh, a series around say this point uh, with the components uh, x j l. Um, and then we go over all these uh, uh, points XL. Okay, so that's a bit uh, the idea. And now, okay, so uh, what we can do is we can write down on the point A, around the point A, the, the, the Taylor uh, approximation around this uh, point A. And uh, that can be then written, right? That's uh, just this form and that can be rewritten as a um, polynomial in the, in the X. Uh, multivariate um, and now we can essentially build a neural you know, network that can um, get all these by by again using multiplication operator to uh, that approximates these x to the gamma and uh, then together we can build a large network that also uh, somehow approximates the full thing and then therefore it's, uh, it builds this uh, Taylor uh, polynomial and then we know that it's uh, close to the uh, f uh, in the neighborhood of the point A. And of course, there's lots of little details that has to be taken care of, and that is something I've been working out in a, in an article how to how to do that. Okay, so now uh, we have, uh, by combining the, the localization and the Taylor, and that's again with these sorts of modular structure that you use a part of the network to do one thing, another part to do the other thing, and then you combine it later. Um, one can um, 
achieved and finally this result that tells us that if we have a say Hurler smooth uh, function of uh, or with index uh, smoothness index beta um, and we take the depth to be okay l and the width has to be is bounded by an n and now we take it to be a sparse neural network okay and the sparsity right it's the number of non-zero coefficients and most of these uh, are, are, are zero, but I uh, say the sparsity is bounded by n times l, n. So essentially, the width times the number of of layers. Um, and I come to that in, in a second. Why we do that? Um, what we get, what we achieve then, is that the approximation error is bounded by two terms. First of all, the classical approximation rate. Right. So how many how many parameters do we have here? We have essentially n times m parameters. So if we would just, uh, just have n parameters, then we know essentially from the previous discussion that n to the minus beta over d, and the d is here called r, so that's the, the r here, so the dimension, n to the minus beta over r would be the optimal approximation rate. Here we lose a bit because uh, there's no dependence on the m here. Um, and secondly, we get this additional term here that is n to the, times 2 to the minus m, and that comes essentially from this, uh, this 2 to the minus m is the the, the thing that we had from the approximation of the square function, right? So that's just really the depth thing. If we don't take a deep neural network, then we will suffer here in the rate um, by, from, from this part. And that also includes an, an N. Um, okay, so just to, when do we get a good approximation rate? For this part, we want to make M large, um, but that is not very, I mean, to make it M very, very large is not very wise. Because if we make it very large, then we suffer here somehow a lot, right? It should be the classical thing would be m n to the minus beta over r, and here we don't have the m, and if m is large, then the gap would be quite big to the to the approximation rate. Therefore, that is here you see a bit of trade off of the depth um, for this for the second uh, term. We don't want to have a large m, so you would just want to essentially take m to be something like log n or so, and then it's fine. Um, uh, okay, so there's a question uh, for the approximation rate. Is that caused yes. by the local Taylor uh, expansion? Uh, partially, yes. Yeah, but it's also caused by all the other errors that occur, occur because we approximate everything, right? You approximate multiplications, you approximate uh, the partition of unity, and then also you approximate the Taylor expansions and uh, the sums of them and so on. That's uh, all together is, um, goes then into the F tilde, right? That's a network. The F tilde, uh, and um, that creates the, the approximation error. Yeah. Okay, and so finally we have, so how many parameters does this network have? Well, if we have with n, then we have essentially n squared times m many network uh, parameters, right? Because the, the, those are weight matrices, so they have the n times n, so it's n squared, and we have m of them because that's essentially the order of the of the depth. Okay, so it's just an order, it's not exact. So, um, so that's the number of parameters, potential network parameters that we have in this model, in this network, and um, in this network model. And so what's the, the issue with that is later, right, this, this is the statistical complexity. And in fact, we only need uh, n times m to be non-zero here. And if we now would instead use, okay, would forget about this and would say, okay, let's take a dense network, then we would also really suffer later in the in the convergence rates and we would get highly suboptimal convergence rates. And that is really that we keep track also on the number of non-zero parameters that saves later um, that we get uh, the, the minimax estimation rates and so the best optimal uh, convergence. And for that, it's really important to to, to, to look at sparse networks. And that is uh, something I also want to discuss later, but here it occurs essentially for the first time. And it's not so, so weird because it's also observed and practiced that somehow the signal, sometimes people make these, these plots where they, they take the input and then they show in every, for, for one data example, they show in every hidden layer, which of these neurons, which of the units are activated. And actually here it's just a, a, a form that the signal somehow focuses linearly through the network. And that is essentially what is in, what is in here in this condition. That is not so strange. Um, um, but still, of course, uh, 
people wonder about can can we relax it can are there dense networks that have the same the good approximation property but also only use n times n parameters and so on there are many other questions that one can ask here in regarding this result okay um so that's essentially what i what i told you there's a trade-off um we have a trade-off between the depth and also it requires sparse networks um now let's talk about statistics so that's something we haven't done at all or very little only with um, the sparing result so now let's look at the statistical problem problem and we want to we want to get an um, estimation rate statistical risk bounds for that and here we look at the most standard one the non-parametric regression framework and um so that's uh, okay let me skip this it's actually quite quite clear so what's the statistical framework well we have uh, inputs x1 to xn and for each input we have a corresponding output and that's a y so suppose you want to to predict uh, the, the the income of a person based on i don't know lots of covariates uh, that that are stored in the x's maybe the level of education the length of education the work experience and so on yeah so that's a classical type of regression setup but also the other regression problems that uh, take x to be like a gene problems uh, gene expression problems also where the dimension could be really really large um so and also machine learning problems are often of this type if they are not classification problems okay so, so what we have is we believe somehow that there's a connection between the y's and the x's the x's explain a part of the y's via this transformation f yeah so there's a regression function f that somehow map the x to the i's but on top of the i um uh, the thing we also have measurement errors uh, some perturbations and they are epsilon i's and their model here is standard normal uh, random variables uh, to make it a bit more convenient the whole setup and so what we want is we want to recover the regression function f here from from the data that's unknown to us um, and that's very close also to, to, to classification is a quite a related uh, problem. But what makes it uh, interesting is that it has really been studied uh, extensively. And uh, therefore we have a lot of results already and we can compare to other methods. We can, uh, we, we, yeah, we can really build on the existing results. And that makes it, uh, I think, good to, to, to study neural networks in comparison to what is known for other results already to see where there are the strengths and where are the weaknesses. Okay, so that's uh, set up. So now we have a, a data distribution, the, the regression assumption on the data. And um, now, um, uh, so what is, how do we, how do we estimate? What, what is not an estimator or so? Of course, what everyone would like to do is they would like to, to analyze deep learning, okay? So that means really you take a, like you fix the network architecture, you randomly initializes, then you, you take, for instance, the Hasse gradient descent, and that will bring you to a local minimum, and you want to study what is the statistical property of this local minimum, uh, or, or, or of this estimator that gets stuck in this local minimum. And it's a very good problem. But uh, of course, you can imagine that this is uh, far out of reach um and so what we have been trying to do is to to come up with something that is sensible but it still has to be somehow tractable from a mathematical point of view and so what we propose here is to decouple a bit the optimization from the from the statistics and um so how do we do that um here's nothing new in in just choosing a network architecture LP, yeah, depth and width and all these layers. And now we also choose a, a sparsity level S, yeah, so the number of non-zero parameters that we allow. We don't say where the non-zero parameters are in the, in the neural network, we just say somewhere they, they are. And then uh, we look at the class that is generated by the architecture and the sparsity here. Yeah? So all the networks that have the sparsity and this architecture, they together form this, this function class FLPS. Um, and now we look at the generic estimator. We don't say which estimator we look at. Okay, so we look at an estimator that takes the data and it returns us uh, uh, a neural network in this class. 
Okay, so we don't want to specify exactly how it does that. It could do that by a gradient descent method, it could do whatever you like. Okay, so that's a, a very generic thing. And the only restriction is essentially it maps to the space. It's, a, it's really based on, on neural networks. Uh, in, uh, and uh, so it doesn't, it can't do wavelets or so, right? It, it really has to, 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 to somehow put a neural network to the data set. That is what, what we say here, essentially. And for such a procedure, the natural thing is then to study that what we call the prediction error. So suppose someone gives us a new X without giving us the corresponding label Y or the, the, the output Y. We want to be able to predict Y as good as possible. And for that, we, we compare somehow the, um, the reconstruction that we get based on our estimator with the uh, true function evaluated at the X because that's somehow the best predictor for the Y. And then we want this difference to be small and we look at this in the squared uh, distance and then we, of course there's randomness in the x and then we um, uh, take the expectation which somehow makes this a deterministic quantity by integrating over all the randomness in the model and also in this new observation x. And that's really the, the, the thing, prediction is the, the classical thing you want to do in, in machine learning, right? You don't want to reconstruct some parameters or so. It's really about if you get, someone gives you a new input, you want to say what is the come up with a good estimate what the, what the output or the corresponding output should be. And so now what we want is somehow how the convergence rate, how that uh, decreases to zero is the number of training samples, which is n here as this uh, tends to infinity and the rate of convergence, that's the, that's the target here, that the thing we are interested in. Okay, very good. Now, um, uh, Here's, a, here's an issue, yeah? So we want to discover something new with neural networks. And if we do the classical thing where we just put some smoothness on the regression function f, right? We have to make some sort of assumption, but just any function, there's no, no method. We know that there's no method that can be constructed with any uh, conversion rate or so. So we have to put something like, assume that the, the function we want to recover has a certain smoothness, say, it's beta times differentiable or beta Hilda or beta Sobolev or so. And um, what happens then is that we already have plenty of methods that are optimal in this case. Okay, so um, for instance, kernel smoothing or wavelets. So, so they're all they're all of optimal. And secondly, all of these methods they have to to suffer from the curse of dimensionality. This is this dependence on the on the D in the input dimension, from the input dimension. So uh, that means if we have a large input dimension, these weights are necessarily very, very small unless we take beta of the same order as G or so that was this barren class idea yesterday, then of course it uh, gets uh, reasonable, but uh, is that now a good idea? Probably not. Um, therefore, I think we, what we want to come up, we want to understand and build this thing where neural networks can outperform other methods and uh, so what is a natural function space and natural or structural constraint that we can put on this regression function f where neural networks perform well okay so that's a question uh, one can ask and that is not something that has in, in very little to do with neural networks it's mainly something that we that we make as an assumption based on our underlying statistical models right it's like the statistical modeling part here or we say, okay, so we assume smoothness or we assume a structural assumption. And so now we want to find a good structural assumption. So what is that? Well, essentially the, the structure is assumption that we want to put, I'm very sorry for this plot somehow not, on my screen it doesn't show very well. Um, the structural assumption that we want to assume is that the thing that the function that we want to learn with our neural network is itself some sort of com underlying composition structure. Yeah, so we, uh, it has been argued in the literature that uh, these cases where deep neural networks outperform other methods are cases where uh, itself there's some sort of uh, composition structure in the in the background. The, 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 the function itself is, is composed of smaller things. Yeah, so you can think about a sort of computer program or so that is based on smaller modules and then the output is somehow combining all the smaller things where you can consider like the, the like I don't say it's a great example, but for instance, text or so, right? You from like from letters, you can build words, and then you from words, you can build 
sentences and then from sentences you can build paragraphs and so on. So you see that there's sort of modular structure in the back if you, and then you could exploit that and you could model it. What is important if you assume that such a modular structure exists and what you want to do is that there maybe in one layer of abstraction you can build a lot of objects, but in the next layer you just choose a few of them, for instance, for word, you never use all the letters. And so, so that just means that you have a, a, a small subset that you pick from the previous layer and then combine it into a new function. And that is exactly what we can uh, then propose as a, as a function class. Okay, so what we do is now that the function that we want to learn is assumed to have a composition structure and uh, it's composed of uh, q plus one functions. And these functions, uh, di, they map from the multivariate functions, they say map from r to the di to r to the di plus one. And each of the possible di plus one components of the function gi has smoothness uh, beta i. Okay, so for, for one function, say the smoothness all the same. And now the important thing is it only depends on the ti variables. And ti can be much smaller than the di. So it is a function on r to the di. So, so in, in principle, it can di plus one, many uh, variables. But um, it only, so it, I think it should be a ti here. So it only takes ti many of, of those. So um, suppose it's a function from r10 to r15 and so, but each of the components just depends on three variables or so, right? And the ti would be three, although the di would be 10. And that's a bit uh, the, the structure that we assume here that's uh, um, this that uh, like the next thing only takes a few objects from the from the previous abstraction layer, and then what we is what is important here is what we call the effective smoothness. So now we put smoothness on the functions um, gi. Okay, suppose here's a function gi, but what is important for how well we can estimate this or how well we can do prediction or estimation here is the smoothness of the function f. So if we put uh, smoothness on gi then that induces the smoothness on the f, which is not the same as the smoothness on the gi. And that is exactly what this effective smoothness does. So in the functions that come later, if they have smoothness below one, then this can deteriorate smoothness that is induced on the f. And that is essentially the, the beta i star that is the smoothness that, that as f has then. And what we show is that um, the conversion rates data that we, that we obtain, they only depend on these pairs ti beta i star. They don't depend, and that's the important thing, they don't depend on the di, these ambient dimensions of the intermediate um, uh, function classes. And there are other function systems that have to, been proposed for neural networks. They have some similarities, uh, there are also some generalizations, and, but, but uh, that seems to be really the, the natural function class. So if you think that, that you want to learn is a composition and so, then it seems very natural to use neural networks, of course. Um, so here's an example just to make that a bit clear. So suppose the function that we want, that the regression function depends on three variables, but it's de it's decomposable in this form here. Okay, so it has this form. So we can write it as a G1 composed with a G0. So that makes, and the G0, in the G0 it has two uh, functions, this and that, and they both depend only on one variable, uh, X2 and X3. So that means that G0 uh, becomes a one. And then the second one, the G1, um, that depends on the two variables, uh, G01 and G02, the outputs of that, so the G1 becomes two and that's the same as the G1. But the G0, because it's in principle about three variables, so maybe X1 doesn't play a role, but, um, so that is a two or three, depending on how you de define it. Okay, so here you see that there's a bit of gain by passing to to the T's uh, if one has such a such a structure. Okay, and that's now the, the, the main result that we have. Um, and it comes under some some assumptions. So the first assumption is that uh, the depth of the neural network that just gave it log of the sample size, the, the training sample size log n. And the second condition is that the width of the network can be arbitrarily large, so there's no upper bound on that, but should be larger than the, the network sparsity or the S. And the S, the network sparsity, that's really the thing that has to be chosen of the right order, has to be chosen of, of this 
order, which also requires a bit of knowledge about what these TIs and beta I stars are. So that's the, that's the important bit. And then what the result tells us that for any, any method that somehow gives, that, that fits a neural network to, to the data set, yeah, so it's very generic, but for any of these methods, the prediction error can be written in two terms, the phi n and the delta n. And um, let me first come to, to the delta n. So the delta n is this thing here. And um, so that's the, the, the rate of convergence in the case that the delta n is small and it's essentially the statistical uh, convergence rate. And it's also known to be the, or we have shown that up to log practice, it's the minimax convergence rate, so it's also lower bound. So therefore it's of the same order here, plus the delta n, I will come to that in a second. So that's something like that's the statistical part. And secondly, we have the delta n. And since we haven't said anything about what this method is, how it fits the neural network to the data set, there can be, of course, very good methods and there can be very bad methods. And that is measured in the in this one quantity delta n, how good this method is. Okay, so and the delta n is really the thing that completely characterizes that because it also it also appears in the in the upper and lower bound by up to log factors. Um, so it's really the, 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 the quantity that really matters. Okay, so what is the delta n? Well, we have to look, in order to understand what delta n is, we have to look into the, what is called the energy landscape. So we look at the loss that is induced by uh, for every parameter. Now it is a high dimensional parameter space, so, so I can't uh, plot it, but let's say we have one parameter theta, and then we look at the, the loss um, or the risk uh, for this parameter theta based on the on the data set, yeah. And that's the training class here, so the, uh, that we also can access from the from the method. And now this is a, a non-convex problem. Therefore, it has it's believed to have a lot of local minima, so it looks maybe like like this, yeah? but it's of course high dimensional. So that's this energy landscape, and uh, it has a global somewhere there's a, a global minimum, at least one. Okay, so and um, the delta N measures how low you get in this energy landscape compared to, to the energy of the global minimum. Okay, so that's the energy of the global minimum. That's this uh, corresponding to this point. And that's the, the energy of your method. And if you, for instance, get stuck in this local minimum, then there is a, a gap here, okay? So there's a, a gap between the energy of the global minimum and the local minimum. And that is essentially an, an average, this, this average gap that you uh, occur or incur by, the, by choosing uh, this uh, network reconstruction method, that is the delta N, okay? So, and it tells you, if you don't get very low in your energy landscape, then the delta N will necessarily be very large and then it will dominate this, this part here. Yeah? So it will dominate the, the, the right hand side, it will dominate the risk from below and above. So there's nothing you can do against that. So, uh, but if you manage to, to, and all the gradient descent methods, of course, they try to minimize that thing, right? They try to get as low as possible in the, in, in the, in the energy landscape. And if, you, if you're successful and you get very low, a minimum which, which is very close to the global minimum in terms of energy, not in terms of like the parameter distances. So they, like this can be very far away, but the, 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 the energy should be small. Then the delta N will be small. And in this case, then we have this phi N dominating and that is really the optimal statistical rate. So then you have an optimal statistical method because we also know it's the minimum estimation rate. So overall statistical methods, no method can achieve a faster rate than this one. Okay. so that. Essentially, we, we can't say now for one specific gradient descent method or so what the delta M is. Well, we can give somehow a high level um, um, result that tells, okay, so uh, all what you should care about is to get as cheap as possible and make, yeah, and if you get stuck in a uh, local minimum with a, with a large training loss, uh, for instance, better reinitialize and try it again in order to to get a smaller training class because that is really what matters to make this delta and small one to get good statistical uh, convergence properties. Um, yeah, and there are lots of, uh, you know, 
assumptions also on this energy landscape, how it looks like, how these local minima are distributed in, in terms of energy around the local uh, global minimum. Some people believe they're all in a small band. Um, and then that would mean essentially, if one could show that one would have an automatic control on what delta n is for all methods that somehow get stuck in a local minimum. Okay, so that's a bit uh, the statistical result. Now let, let me come a bit to the, to the interpretation. Um, uh, yeah, uh, first of all, this empirical risk minimizer, that is the global minimum essentially. Yeah? So that's an, a statistical or learning uh, theory that's called empirical risk minimizer, which is not computable in this case because it's a uh, yeah, it's non convex problem. But that is optimal in this class. So it's uh, really achieves, delta, in, in this case, the delta n is equal to zero. And then there's, um, uh, you achieve the statistical optimal, statistically optimal rate. Um, what is interesting is what I mentioned before is that we have, uh, we want to model this as a high dimension problem. So for, for the Alex net, I showed that they had like 60 million parameters and only 1.2 million uh, uh, training uh, samples. And I come, I answer the question in a second. I just want to finish this argument. And in this result, that is essentially possible. Yeah. So there's the, the number of parameters that you have in your network, because there's no upper bound on the width, can be can be n to the 100 where n is your sample size. So, so it can be much, much larger than the sample size. That's not the, the crucial bit. The crucial thing in this result is that you get the regularization right. You know, the regularization here is induced by the by the sparsity of the network. But in principle, you can indeed have much, much more parameters than, than training data in this, in this result. Yeah, so in the sparsity, the regularization, that is the, the crucial bit. Um, okay, now let me come to the question by Romain. Uh, don't we want to have a delta end that stays not too close to zero in order to avoid overfitting? <laughs> yeah, very good. So essentially by by inducing the sparsity constraint, we, we already take care of the possibility of overfitting. Um, if you would not, if you don't put something uh, constraint here, then there, uh, of course, uh, you could have one zero training losses. So and that would be a different story. Um, and then what you might wonder is, okay, so this uh, depth uh, block N, that's something uh, which is maybe also interesting for practitioners because it says, if you have more data, take a deeper network, or maybe you can, some people argue, okay, so that shows that uh, deep networks is a big, a big data phenomenon or so, because uh, you, you, you get a dependence on the sample size. If you have a small sample, you take it, not a deep, deep network. Um, where does it come from? Well, it's what I explained before, essentially the sort of doubling property of uh, having additional layers. So if you add layers, you can double the number of linear pieces with these value networks. And if you have log n layers, you get uh, two to the log n. So essentially of uh, a polynomial order of n um, many linear pieces. And that is exactly what you need in order to get a good uh, approximation, a good approximation theory. Um, okay, so then there's another question about the sparsity. And this is something I will answer in, in maybe two or three slides from now. Yeah, and I want to I, I give a more uh, extended discussion about uh, sparsity in a second. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, the dependence on the sample size, I think that's an interesting phenomenon that occurs in the, in the theory. Um, let's see what else is that already did a slide on the sparsity. Um, yeah, so, so here's another thing which is maybe interesting to notice. So we have a method that is based on piecewise linear functions. And then we know that for normally the saturation, if we take for instance piecewise linear splines or so, we cannot get the, the optimal statistical convergence rates for higher order smoothness. Like, like if we take piecewise linear splines, we know that only up to a smoothness two. And uh, if we take piecewise constant approximations only up to smoothness one and so on, if we are above that smoothness with the true regression function, then we, we lose, because uh, there's no efficient approximation theory anymore. What is interesting here is we have a scheme that is based on piecewise linear functions, and that uh, one would believe only can do smoothness up to uh, like smoothness two, and then afterwards you don't get the optimal rate, but you get them actually for all smoothness indices. Um, 
and that is interesting that is again something which comes from the uh, sort of approximation theory and with the deep neural networks yeah so you have very efficient approximations for instance of the square function and that is the smooth function based on these on, based on composing neural networks so that's a, a, a difference compared if you want, want, want to compare neural networks with uh, piecewise linear splines which are also piecewise linear functions right so you can wonder what is now the difference but here really this composing and the nonlinearity are the essential part okay let me maybe skip this for um, um yeah uh there are, i want to come to this parse theory yeah because homo was asking about it um okay so so here's the thing and i've been discussing them from many many people that always what, what comes back in this result so so is now this network sparsity that now really important or not um because if you just do plain deep learning then you don't get a, a sparse neural network and what is maybe interesting is that after i completed this so this is something i couldn't work it out without sparsity so it was just impossible i tried a lot of things and that occurred somehow very natural in, in a natural way in the in the math yeah so that's just something that came just from the mathematics and to get optimal rates uh, somehow that was the, the right constraint and later uh, i think people now are really practitioners are now really trying to 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 get also to to sparse neural networks and i just want to uh, discuss uh, three different approaches here so the first approach is uh, the, that you train a deep neural network and you sparsely cry it afterwards. So it's uh, like from the compression community, they say, why? Well, okay, so you have here 60 million parameters in the AlexNet, for instance, and just 1.2 million training data. So there should be lots of redundant parameters. So there should be a lot of redundancy in that. So we should be able to, to take out a lot of parameters um, and uh, without that, that uh, somehow the performance drops or so, right? That's the, that's the idea. And then they look at the gradient and they look at parameters that don't change, that don't change the gradient so much or so, and then uh, they take them out. And the compression rates is that are reported in the literature is about 95%. That means out of 20 parameters, you can take away 19 and keep one, which means if you have 60 million parameters, that would reduce that. Uh, to uh, 3 million parameters, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so it's still larger than the training size, but uh, there are some efficient uh, uh, post-hoc uh, uh, compression schemes to make it a sparse network. That's uh, one way to do it. Another way to do it is you can start with a sparse network topology. And what is the idea behind that? Well, I think there are people who try to find methods that are in between the the tree-based methods, yeah. You know, so, for instance, uh, uh, yeah, the, we, we have lots of uh, tree-based methods in, in statistical learning where you're essentially only allowed to split along the coordinate axis, yeah. You know, so maybe along the x1 axis in your or x3 or so. And in the neural network, you can put the hyperplanes in any direction you like. You don't. You're not bound to to split them according to the coordinate axis. And then people think well maybe you should come up with something which is in between where you have a bit more flexibility than what you typically have in decision trees um, but you have less maybe flexibility than for full neural networks so and then if you think about this sort of approaches you also typically end up with some um, with sparse network topologies that you specify right from the beginning and then you learn those ones and you end up with a sparse network um, and the final thing, I, I guess, the, the final direction that I'm aware of is that people say, okay, so we want to actually bring them closer to what happens in the human brain. That is where these neural networks actually come from. In the human brain, that is a sparsely connected neural network. So how do we how do we do that? How do, yeah. And then of course you come to something like more iterative versions of of learning, and the approach that I'm familiar with is that people say, okay, so let's do a random topology in the beginning, a sparse topology, network topology. So we specify some non-zero parameters, then we do the training based on those ones. Then we do compression. We kick out all the parameters that are not relevant for the output or hardly relevant for the output. And then we are randomly allocate new connections in the neural network. So we choose and we, we add something to the to the 
uh, topology and then based on this uh, added net network um, connections we retrain the net and then we keep it between training and and compression and, and generating new sparse network topologies and that also leads to something that is then sparse in the in the end and that is what they claim is somehow a bit more in line of how the, the human learning uh, works so there are some approaches in, in this direction okay so uh, now it's a bit of question so we have uh, uh, five minutes uh, left so unfortunately i'm i didn't get very far i have more slides but i think you can maybe look them up and um i will i will make them available and then i, I guess you get to see them um yeah maybe one slide before the uh the, i wanted to talk a bit more about the energy landscape and also about this over parameterization phenomenon i didn't really have time here i think they're really interesting new phenomena that are not really well understood yet and uh, theory still can contribute a lot i mean it's quickly developing and so but it's also very exciting a field. I haven't talked at all about these convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, auto encoders, and so on. There are many uh, different structures. Uh, some of them are analyzed uh, at this moment. Uh, some of them are still open. Um, there are also new things, for instance, with generative adversary networks, we are generating new, new, uh, for instance, paintings or so that look like uh, uh, paintings of 19th century painters or so but uh, they are artificially generated. So that also brings us to new questions, essentially how to analyze them. And even this uh, GANs are also interesting from a statistical perspective. So this machine learning thing, I, I believe there are many, many uh, you know, new, exciting uh, directions that one still can go. Um, it's also, of course, a bit of a messy uh, field that tons of uh, papers uploaded on, on archive uh, every day. But still, I think uh, yeah, one can often find uh, something uh, new to work on. And so I really recommend that also to people who are thinking maybe what, what direction should I go. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, I just want to mention that uh, we also, we have a very nice uh, statistics group at the University of Trento and uh, young, diverse, and uh, also you know, yeah, always have lots of French people working there. We have constantly openings for PhD and postdocs position. Um, lots of like topics and theory of machine learning. Uh, we do a bit of uh, privacy and time series and uh, ensemble methods and so on. Um, PhD positions in the Netherlands are four years. They're fully paid and the salary is quite good. So you get 14 payments, although the month we all know has only 12 months. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a nice environment. So if you think about this, uh, that this is an option for you, I should and just feel free to uh, to contact me and to see whether there's a, whether there's a match. Okay, and so with this, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, thanks also for this very interesting questions. Also, I learned a bit and uh, later we see us for the computer session and now there's still time for a few questions. Thank you very much, Johannes, for this very interesting talk. So, are there some questions for Johannes first in the A1 room? Doesn't seem so. Are there? Ah, yes, there is one. Sorry. Uh, is there a reference for um, the theorem at the slide uh, 24 about the approximation rate? Let me go back to this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is also in this. It's a paper that I I wrote in in the Annals of Statistics, and that is the approximation theory. Yeah, yeah. It's a discussion paper uh, that finally appeared uh, last year. I think it was printed last year. Yeah, yeah. Called non parametric regression for deep your network with value activation function as well. Yeah. Are there other questions in room A1? Doesn't seem so. So in room A2, our online participants, do you have some questions for Johannes? Oh, let me. There is a question. Uh, so there are. Uh, 
There is a question by Heng Shui Liu, sorry if I don't pronounce the name correctly. For the deep neural networks, the overfitting would not actually be a problem since the prediction error just keep improving on new data as the network complexity increases, but this is not the case for classical statistical models where overfitting would deteriorate the prediction on new data. Could you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have some results on that, and I'm, it's very, it's a pity that I could not uh, discuss that here. Essentially, it, uh, like my understanding of this is that it really depends on, on the sort of data problem, like the underlying um, generating mechanism of the data, whether overfitting is a good idea or not. Um, so if you, for instance, have, have noisy data, then what we can show actually, maybe I can find this slide. Um, let me see this one slide. Which one it is? Uh, Oh, give me a second, please. It's slide 57, okay. Um, yeah, so what we can show is, okay, suppose this, the blue dots are the, the data points and uh, the red function is the function that you want to learn. And then what we can show that in a, in a bit of simplified uh, setup that this SGD converges to the natural cubic spline interpolant of the of the noisy data and that is a terrible estimator yeah so it's not going very good uh, uh, yeah, like not fitting the red curve very well and that is a, a negative result that shows that overfitting also for neural networks is not always uh, so great why is it then working in so many cases well, I think that has to do with the fact that um, if you, for instance, look at uh, classification problems where you want to classify cats versus dogs or so, that they have a very specific uh, st structure, the, the data. Yeah, so what is, uh, um, if I can maybe go to my slide 27. So, okay, so what we want to do is we want to somehow tell apart what is a dog picture and what is a cat picture. So, instead of this traditional thing with additive noise, we have what is, what is the noise here in this picture. So, everyone can say this is a dog, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a cat. So, that's not so very difficult, right? So the full information is in the covariates about uh, the response. There's, in the sense, there's not something that is not explained in the in, from the y's and uh, in the x's, I say, right? There's no external thing that is that, that comes um, that we cannot observe. So that means we observe the full thing. And um, the randomness is completely different. The randomness is somehow that the dog image is, you can imagine that it's some sort of random deformation of a, say, template uh, dog or so, or that is a random deformation of a template cat. And that is a very different type of of a data generating mechanism where, yeah, if you don't have these denoising problems, then interpolation indeed might make uh, a lot of sense. Um, and then you can, in this over permit price regime, also get good uh, rates. But if you, for instance, have a denoising problem or even worse, if you have a inverse problem where you also have to regularize the, the operator, the inverse operator, so uh, then uh, over permitization, in my opinion, doesn't, doesn't work at all with no method.